we're going to look at today, kind of a, we're going to kick off Advent and, and look a little bit at what that means and give you a vision for that. And we'll spend the next uh, four weeks following all the way up to Christmas talking about hope and joy and love and peace. And it's my prayer that this is a, a tremendous blessing to you and that it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of enjoyment and it's a lot of learning. Uh, we're not a liturgical church, so we don't have uh, lots of candles that we're going to be lighting or, or anything like that. But it, it's still good to review or, or, or maybe for the first time, if you're not from that background, learn about what Advent is about. But before we dig into that, just to kind of get us kicked off, you probably know this, but the reality is now that we're in this season, you know, we just had our Thanksgiving, right? Oops, sorry. We just had our Thanksgiving, and that comes with that Black Friday, and then we've got Cyber Monday coming, and there's really no season within our year that we will suffer more propaganda than we do during this season. I mean, this is the season where you kind of have those over-realized hopes that everybody is trying to sell you on. Every commercial, every holiday special. I mean, there's a whole TV station that shows nothing but cheesy holiday special films. How many of you ladies like that one? My wife loves that. My wife loves that station, right? And, and, and it's like, it's like a, a continual rolling relationship story from Rex to redemption. And if, if you've watched one, you've watched them all. They just have different actors in them, in my opinion. But that's okay. If you like it, enjoy it. But that, that, that kinda, there's a lot of sales for those kinds of things this time of year, right? They're, they're trying to uh, get us to believe that all of your family strife, all of your broken relationships it's, is going to just kind of melt away as your family begins to gather together, right? And then on that Christmas morning, right, the miracle of all miracles is going to happen. There'll be no arguments. Everybody's going to be just enthralled with every present you bought them. None of your children after about five hours are going to discard the toys because they're not bored with them, right? That's going to be the best gift ever every time they open up a package, right? That's what we hear, right? That's what they're trying to sell us with every TV ad, with every radio station, every print ad. They're, they're trying to, to sell us this idea that everything is going to be perfect. Everything is going to come together like, like never before. Joy, reconciliation, restoration, right? When everybody shows up at your house this year, you're going to completely forget why you didn't like them for so long before. Right? You know? Isn't that going to happen this year? And, 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 and not only are you going to forget why you didn't like them, they're going to actually apologize to you this year for why you didn't like them. Right? Is that going to happen? Well, maybe, maybe not. But the commercials would have you believe something like that's going to happen. And then not only that, not only will they apologize, they're going to give you a gift that is absurdly beyond their budget. And they're going to bless you with something amazing. Right? Uh, that's what Christmas is going to be about, right? And, and not only that, your kids are going to be perfectly well-behaved. Perfect. You're, you're going to have, I mean, you're, you're going to think there'll be halos hovering over their heads, right? Perfect. Perfect children this season. That's kind of what, if you buy into the commercialism anyhow, they would have you believe, did you know there's actually a form of depression that comes in this world after we survive Christmas? There is a clinical type of depression that some people experience that after they've finally made it through Christmas, they, they, they reach a point of depression. And, and it's not just a few. There's quite a few people in this world who experience it. Folks, I hope through this Christmas season to offer you something better than that, right? My hope is as you come, as you spend some time with us, as we dig into these themes, as we look at these aspects of Advent, what I want to lay out before you is that long after the Christmas tree is gone and it's dead or you've put it back up in the attic, right? Long after that, long after... Many times our unrealistic hopes dissipate unmet. That as we go through this, we find 
that nonetheless, God meets us where we are. And then in that provides hope for us where we are. And gives us something that we can earnestly look forward to. That thing that is which to come. Now as Christians in this season, we are celebrating Advent as I said. The word Advent simply means coming or arrival. Right? Nothing too complex there. And for Christians, it's, it's, it's far more than just a simple celebration, though, of, of a little moment about 2,000 years ago, right? Advent is a, a celebration that Christ has come and that his power is at work in the present day and that he will return, but this time not as a baby, but instead as a ruling king. So Advent for us isn't just, oh great, you know, that six-pound baby Jesus was born and into the world and yada, 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 right? We sing away in the manger and then we're done. It's so much more than that. Although that is a piece of it. We do want to celebrate the six-pound baby Jesus born in a manger in Bethlehem. But there is so much more. Because see, as we go through Advent, part of Advent is looking behind us. But part of Advent is also looking forward to what is to come. And to get our hearts focused on, on that, rather than the world's, you know, shop until you drop, make everybody happy, the fear of man, the panic attack that we call Christmas, right? We have to put a little work into it so that we don't get absorbed by that and drawn in, lured in, and sucked in by that. And instead stay biblically centered and, and remind ourselves and remind our families what the season truly is about. And as we do that, my hope is that we will see that Christ is working in the world and the fact that he has come and the fact that he is at work in the world and the fact that he is returning to the world to make all things new gives us so much hope. So every weekend we're going to come in here we're going to stop. We're going to breathe, right? We're going to take a break from the hubbub and the madness of the world. We're going to look at who God is. We're going to see who God is. See what his story tells us. What he's up to in our lives and in our world. Now, if we could just simply do this by once a week gathering for an hour, that would be pretty amazing, right? Right? but we can't. And so our hope is to equip you uh, along the way with some other items that you could use. Um, I posted this on our Facebook site as well as on the church website today. But we have an Advent devotional that if you would like to follow along. Um, this is called Where the Light Shines Brightest, uh, put together by the Billy Graham Evangelical Association. Uh, a friend of mine, Ed Stetzer, oversaw this project. It's a pretty neat thing. There's a bunch of different authors in it. And if you would like just a simple set of readings and then a prayer for each day through Advent, grab one of these. There's a dozen or so sitting on the Welcome Center. I've got a few more in the office. And then, as I said, you can download it right off of the Internet, right off the church website, or right off the church's Facebook page if you would like an Advent devotional to work your way through. So we want to equip you with that. We're going to try to encourage you throughout the week on social media, on Facebook, and other places. And just try to make sure that we stay grounded. Because it's so easy, so easy, to get so distracted this time of year and caught up in the things that, while they are enjoyable, don't necessarily matter in an eternal sense. So our goal is to come alongside of you, to help you pause and take a breath each weekend, to see the power of Jesus at work in our lives, and then to fully enjoy the season. Now this morning we are going to be talking about uh, God as our deliverer. Now when I say that God is our deliverer, here's what it is that I'm saying. God is the one who saves us from danger or destruction. And I'm going to give you multiple illustrations of that today. Some synonyms of this would be things like God is our liberator or our protector or our defender or, or a hero or our savior, right? And now to show that God is indeed our deliverer. I want to show what happens to the people of God first. And we're going to start a long time ago. 
We're going to go way back into the Bible to the book of Exodus, which might seem like a weird place to start off a Christmas season, but bear with me. We'll get there, okay? If you're not familiar with the book of Exodus, right at the very beginning of your Bible, you've got Genesis, then Exodus, second book. If you've got a Bible, I'm going to be in Exodus, and I'm going to kind of walk my way through a bunch of Exodus at a fairly quick pace, but you're welcome to open a Bible, or if you've got an iPhone or iPad or smartphone of some sort, open up a Bible and follow along. Uh, and then at the end, we'll get to Matthew 1, 21, and talk about that in context of God as our deliverer. But in Exodus 1... If you don't have a church background, I'll try to catch you up quickly. It's kind of a long story, but it's a really good story. This is a story that we've been studying on Wednesday nights with our, our, our young student ministry, our kids men here at church. I referenced this briefly last week. So I'll try to kind of catch you up with this story. The people of God, God's chosen people, find themselves living in Egypt. They're not there first, though, as slaves. But they're there first because Joseph, who was a Jew, through the sovereign hand of God, had made his way up through the ranks of the Egyptian ruling class. And, and he actually saves Israel from a horrific drought that was going on in the world at that time. He, he saves his family and the nation of Israel, brings them into Egypt, and uh, saves them from this enormous problem in the world. Now, this is before Jerusalem is established. This is before the Israelites had entered Israel as a nation and taken the promised land, before the nation was inhabited by the people of God. And so we pick it up there in Exodus 1.8. And now I, I know I said I referenced some of this last week, but, but it's good, I think, to cover this again so we get the big picture. It reads this. Now, there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many, and they're too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, then they might join our enemies and fight against us and escape from this land. And it continues on and says, Therefore they, they set some taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. Interesting side note of history. When the church is persecuted, the church grows, even way back at the time of Moses. Then it says, and the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all of their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So difficulty and, and hardship and pain probably shouldn't surprise us because it's everywhere, right? Right? Here we have the people of God, the people loved by God, the people called by God as his own, who are being, according to the text, dealt with shrewdly, right? Now, if we're honest, a number of us in this room probably could relate to that experience, right? Yeah, I can relate to being dealt with shrewdly. I think that's happened to me multiple times in the last year, in fact, right? And that says they're afflicted with heavy burdens. And again, for some of us, that probably resonates in our hearts a little bit. And we go, yeah, I've had some heavy burdens this year. There are those of us who are like, oh yeah, not only that, but man, I kind of feel oppressed. Maybe you're not oppressed by some nation or some government. Maybe, maybe you've just been wrestling with some dark oppressive sin and you're struggling and you're like, oh, I feel oppressed. Sometimes the people of God are in situations that are difficult. And it feels as though that Maybe we've been abandoned by God, right? That where is God in this moment? It's like, is God anywhere to be found in this story? Where is God in his salvation? Yet as we see the story progress, we see in Exodus 2, 23, these words. It says, during those many days, the king of Egypt died. And it says, the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And it says, God heard their groaning. God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, 
and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. That's a a profound little text there in Exodus 2. Because here's what it'll lay before all of us. First, God knows, right? Regardless of where you are at in life, here's the great news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The great truth about our God as a deliverer. God is not a stranger to where you are. God isn't ignorant of what's going on in your life. God isn't ignorant of what's going on in your heart, in your mind, in your relationships. Not only that, he's not surprised by any of it. He's not shocked. God isn't sitting in heaven, shuddering at what's going on, wondering what to do. No, it says God knows. And then in the text, we also see this. Not only does God know, but it says God hears. It's most often in our, in our difficult times where we feel like, maybe you felt like this, you know, you're praying, but you're like, man, are my prayers, this is like a prayer-proof ceiling. They don't seem like they're getting through anywhere, right? You ever had those kind of times in life? Where you're wondering, is my antenna broken? God, can you hear me? I know I've had those times where we feel like we're, we're crying out and no one is listening. Yet we see in this text that God is indeed not only knowing, but he's listening. And then, not only that, but we see that God intervenes. Now with Moses, as we continue with the story, Moses is the the second Hebrew who works his way up into the elite of the Egyptians. One day Moses hears and sees that one of his countrymen is being dealt with harshly by an Egyptian guard. Things get a little out of hand and Moses ends up killing the guy, right? Killing him with his bare hands. If you've not read the Bible, man, there's some grimy stories in the Old Testament particularly. It's earthy. Real to life. Moses is angry. He kills a guy. He doesn't think anybody saw it. So what's he do? Goes and digs a hole in the desert, rolls it in like the mob, and thinks he got away with it. Right? The next day, he's out walking, and he sees two fellow Hebrews having a fight with one another. He he gets between them. He breaks them up, right? And one of them says, well, what are you going to do now? Are you going to kill me like you did the Egyptian? In that moment, he knows he's busted. He knows word of what he's done is going to make it back to the Pharaoh. So he runs. He runs and he hides in the mountains. And for 40 years, he goes and is a shepherd. A man who had been in the ruling elite of all of Egypt is now a sheep herder out in the hills. But if you know the story, then it's at that point then that God comes to Moses through a bush that's burning, but is not consumed, right? And God says, Moses, I've heard the cry of my people, and I'm going to deliver them. And you're going to do it for me, Moses. Now Moses says, oh, hold on a second, God. I, I, I'm not a good speaker. I stutter. I can't do that. Moses says, God says to Moses, Moses, I am with you. He'll be okay. And Moses makes some other complaints. He complains about this. He complains about that. (sighs) God, you got to pick somebody else, not me. I'm not suited. This isn't my thing. I don't think this is my calling, God. Which is kind of weird. God's the one who's issuing the calling, right? And yet God intervenes at each one of his, his little excuses and says, Yeah, Moses, you're weak. Yeah, Moses, you might fail. But you know what? I'm not going to. I'm going to go with you. Moses, let's go. Moses, if it makes you feel better, then we'll take Aaron with us. Right? But you got to know Aaron's going to be an idiot along the way. He's going to cause you some problems. He's going to cause you some big troubles. But I'll deal with him later. 
But Aaron's going to go with us now since you've kind of been dragging your feet. So then Moses shows up in the story, if you're following along in, in Exodus, and there's this great confrontation between Pharaoh and the God of the universe. Pharaoh, who likened himself, Pharaoh, who, who believed that in some sense he was God. He believed in some sense that he was divine. And as we read through scripture, we see that he digs his heels in against God's command to release God's people so that they could go to the promised land. So God, through his servant Moses, has all, all of the water in Egypt turned to blood. Right? Remember that part of the story? Now, if it was me and I was like out fishing by Malax one day and... The lake turned to blood. I'd be like, all right, God, whatever you say. That's enough for me, right? But we're talking the River Nile. We're talking all of the water in Egypt. Turns to blood. I mean, I would have been like, gone. Go, take your people and run. But scripture says Pharaoh's heart's hardened. Pharaoh has a hardened heart towards the Lord. Pharaoh sees himself kind of as God. So he digs his heels in. Well, if you know the story, next there's the plague of frogs. Frogs everywhere. Frogs in your cupboard. Frogs in your bed. Frogs everywhere. Frogs in your bath. Frogs, you go to hop in the shower, there's frogs there, right? It's a plague of frogs. Not that it's like a couple of toads. We're talking massive amounts of frogs. Then after the frogs, you have the gnats, right? And after the gnats, then come the flies. Then after the flies, the livestock begin to die. And then all of the country breaks out in pus, oozing, painful, seeping, stinking, nasty boils. Right? Think like your whole body covered in zits that ooze. What it was like. Gross. Right? Pharaoh keeps digging his heels in. Then hail comes and destroys half of the city. And then locusts. And then it just one day stops being day altogether, right? Think about this. The sun doesn't shine one day. Like you went and got up and were ready to go to work and it's still dark out. and It's noon. What's going on here? A little weird, right? You would think somewhere along the way, Pharaoh's heart would have softened. But Pharaoh is confident. Pharaoh has an ego. Pharaoh thinks he is, in a sense, God. Then finally, we come to the institution of what we know today as the Passover meal. This Passover meal that foreshadows the person who will come in the works of Jesus Christ. The people of Israel are told to go and slaughter a spotless lamb and to take the blood of the lamb and, and to wipe it across the doorposts of their homes, right? There was some other stuff along with that. But that was the big one. Because the angel of death was going to come through the city and the firstborn of every family in Egypt was going to die unless the door was marked by the blood of the Lamb. So sure enough, here comes the angel of death in the middle of the night. And the firstborn son of every family in Egypt dies that night suddenly, except for those in the house of Israel who obeyed the commands of God and put the blood of the spotless lamb above the doorposts. And the Bible says, Then in that moment there arose out of Egypt a great cry as men and women woke up to their firstborn sons being dead. And there was sorrow upon sorrow and mourning upon mourning. The Pharaoh's own son was not spared in the death of these boys. And it's finally at that point that Pharaoh relents. Pharaoh releases the people of God. And you can imagine as he's going through his grief, then his grief turns, his, turns itself into rage. I mean, certainly would in my heart, I think. Certainly without the grace of God. So Pharaoh is enraged, and he's now bloodthirsty. He's enraged. He gathers an army after he sent them out. He says, all right, get out of here. Sets them free. 
goes through the grieving process, gets angry and says, hold on a second, we've got to go get them. So he sends an army, not to bring them back, but to destroy them, and begins to pursue the Israelites. Now maybe you're thinking to yourself as I'm talking here, all right, all right, you had me at God hears, right? You had me at God knows, okay? But you're losing me a little bit with this God intervenes. Because let me tell you, in my life, in my world, in the kind of brokenness that I'm walking in and experiencing, in my frustration, in my anger, in my depression, in my hurt, in my anxiety that I'm walking in, this kind of miraculous intervention is nowhere to be found. Maybe you feel that way. There's never been any water in my life turned to blood. I've never seen these plagues in my life. The, the, this miraculous God you're talking about, Pastor, has never intervened in my life. Yet, here you sit today. When I think back on the last 20 years of my own life, following God, following God by His grace, I am struck by the miracle of God saving me from myself, folks. That is a tremendous miracle. But I'm also reminded that all of these little miracles that didn't seem miraculous in the moment, but turned out to make all of the difference in my life. Let me tell you a little bit about my story. I told you I'm going to tell you a couple stories today. The first miracle, and I wouldn't have known it at the time, but the first miracle was way back when I was in college. I became friends with a group of guys just down the hall, including one of which was my college first college roommate. My first college roommate, kid from Minnesota, I went to college in South Dakota. The only reason he and I got put together, I think, is because we were both Lutheran. We had nothing else in common other than being male. Male and Lutheran. They said, put these two guys in a room together, it'll work. Well, it did for a couple of years. And so I get Jason as my roommate, the least athletic person I've ever met, but tremendously nice guy. At the time, he was the least athletic. I've met some that far exceed him now. But I become friends with this group of guys who were serious about their walk with Jesus, but yet they were still open to me despite my sinfulness. When I think back about how crude I was, how offensive I was, how tough it must have been for these mature Christian people. Yet, they kept inviting me. Yet, they kept asking me to go out and do stuff with them. Every Sunday, they'd ask me after I'd played a football game on Saturday, you want to go to church with us? Every Wednesday, you want to come to Bible study? And throughout the week, you want to go to Perkins? You want to do this? You want to do that? I mean, they're just constantly there offering to bring me along. I mean, I'm in my environment and, and I'm hanging out with these guys where like no one swears, no one drinks, no one's getting high, no one's sleeping around. And I mean, that, like, that's their world. Like they're going to serve the Lord. They're quoting Bible verses together. They're singing DC Talk when DC Talk wasn't good. Right? If you're old enough, you'll remember that, those days. And I'm foul mouth. My dad was a motorcycle mechanic and worked in a prison. My grandfather, one side, car mechanic, other side, worked in a prison. Served in the army, served in the navy. You can kind of do the math. I'm out partying, in fast pursuit of the ladies. My world is football and fun. I don't even know how to relate to this world that these guys live in. Yet their patience their refusal to condemn me, their ability to continually circle back around and ask me how my life was going and then my seeing how my life contrasted to their lives. That was God's grace on my life to show me that there was something so much better. And without question, folks, that was a miracle. So maybe you're here today. Maybe you're here today with some baggage. Some baggage you've been carrying. 
Simply hear me say this. God knows. God hears. God works and God is at work in that mess. Maybe just being here today for you is a miracle. I'm glad you made it. Think about the, the vast unchurchness of our culture. By you being here is somewhat miraculous. So maybe today God is trying to minister to you, trying to encourage, trying to love you right where you are. Maybe God's intervening for you like he did for me. Because folks, it was in a dorm room that I first started hearing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. I grew up in the church, but boy, I was tuned out for the first 19 years of my life. But how amazing and how miraculous is it that I heard about Jesus in a dorm room, right? This is not just a dorm. This is an all-men's dorm. And not only is it an all-men's dorm, it's a mostly jock dorm, right? If you know anything about that, you know this is not your bastion of righteous behavior. This isn't the place where you go to seek biblical wisdom in the most part. Yet it was there that I found Jesus. Or better yet, that Jesus rescued me. God placed me with these men in the middle of my offenses. These men who, despite who I was at the time, extended grace to me. And they became a very visible picture of what the kingdom of God looked like. Miraculous, folks. Maybe you've been so busy in your life looking, waiting for God to turn rivers to blood waiting to see the plagues, the gnats, the flies, the sun that doesn't come. Maybe you've been so busy looking for the big ones that you've missed, perhaps, these little miracles God has put into your life along the way. Maybe you've overlooked or maybe you've forgotten the small little miracles that are are right in front of you, maybe even at this moment. Now, if you know the story, it's this point, then Jesus, then Jesus, then Moses, he leads the people of Israel right up to the Red Sea. And then Charlton Heston walks out, right? No, it's not Charlton Heston, it's Moses. Parts the Red Sea. They make it through safely. The walls of water come crashing down and destroy the Egyptian army. Exodus 14, 29. It says, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw Egyptians dead washing up on shore. Israel saw the great power of the Lord that he used against the Egyptians. So the people of the Lord feared the Lord, it says. And they believed in the Lord and his servant, Moses. Now here's something to note. This is what's going to take us into what all of this has to do with Christmas. Because of course, not every Christmas season do you start off, and the firstborn sons of Egypt were killed and an army was drowned in the Red Sea. Merry Christmas, see you next week. Right? But I said I'd get there. Not a normal progression for Christmas, I get that. I'm a little weird. I also get that. So what does this story of God delivering his people out of slavery have to do with the story of God delivering his people out of slavery here, out of Egypt, have to do with our story of Christmas? Well, first, let's be really honest about what's actually happening here. As I said, we see here that Israel is fearing God the Lord. They're remembering the Lord. And they respect his servant Moses. So now they're led out of slavery. They're led to the promised land. A land flowing with milk and honey. How long is this going to last? This free from slavery, this good looking land that's provided for them. How long is this going to last? If you know the story, not very long. They manage to screw it up again right away, don't they? And then they spend 40 years wandering in a desert to make up for it. But see, Moses does this amazing thing. 
Moses shows us this external deliverance of human beings out of physical slavery into a good land. But what we're going to read about here in Matthew 121 is so much bigger and better than that. In Matthew 121, Joseph is visited by an angel. And this is what the angel says to him concerning his betrothed Mary. The angel says, Joseph, Mary is going to bury, bear you a son, and you shall call him Jesus. For he will save or deliver his people from their sins. Moses saved and delivered the people of God out of physical slavery. But the coming of Jesus Christ is not the deliverance of your life or my life from the mere difficulties of the here and now. But the coming of Jesus is rather the salvation of our souls from the root issue that causes the problems, the devastations, the plagues in our lives. Namely, the plague of sin and the plague of death. The coming of Jesus sounded the death toll for death itself, the death of sin once and for all. The coming of Jesus is the eradication of works-based righteousness, where Christ then instead comes in and becomes our righteousness. Jesus showed up and he didn't just tip the scales in our favor, but he destroyed the scales as a measure and gave us his righteousness. See, the coming of Jesus and the power made available to us in this day is freedom. Freedom at the real root issues in our heart. Freedom to step out of the broken places, to step out of the broken spaces of our lives. Now in that, does that mean we're free from struggle? No. The Bible never says we will be free from struggle. And I would never say that because I know it's not true. Life is going to continue to be difficult. We're going to continue to make mistakes. We're going to continue to fail. We're going to continue to be a broken people. But we're going to continue to be better if we're walking with Jesus. We're going to continue to improve. And then the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is in that we are no longer condemned but set free. What we're doing at Advent is looking at the implications that Christ showed up, that Christ arrived, that God didn't send Moses this time, but God came in the flesh, Christ Emmanuel, Jesus, the Son of God. He comes, he shows up, and this time it's not just to deliver us from enslavement, but it's to free our souls forever that he comes to pay the debt, to pay the price that we could not pay, to bring us the power of the Holy Spirit. So as we continue to walk through Advent, yes, we do look back, but we also look forward because Christ has come and delivered us from our sinfulness and Christ will come again to free us forever. We will continue to struggle, folks. I want to be clear on that. But as we struggle, Paul challenges us to strive, to run the race well. Now, I know over the last 20 years of my life, I've made great progress, right? My sin probably hasn't decreased, but my public sin is less obvious, at least. But I think I'm kind of like Paul. I find that the more I dig into the Bible, the more I know Jesus, the, the more I fall in love with this God who first loved me. I, I find myself to be more aware of my sin than less aware. But I think that's okay. Because it keeps me humble and it keeps me working towards being the man God wants me to be. And in this Christmas season, my challenge to you is to be the same. 
Don't get stopped by the things that are in your past. They're part of you. They're part of the story. But they no longer define you. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, live in the freedom. Live looking forward to what he is doing now and what he will do in the future. Because greater things are yet to come. We're going to look at hope. We're going to look at joy. We're going to look at love. We're going to look at peace over the next four weeks. I'd love to have you join us as we dig in. Let's pray.